This morning we, um, we're going to talk about a, a kind of a difficult subject sometimes to talk about, but a very important one as we continue to focus on things that trip us up in life. I want to begin this morning by uh, sharing um, part of what Steve Arterburn wrote who co-authored the book Every Man's Battle. And he was talking about a particular morning that he was driving down the Pacific Coast Highway to, to attend a court hearing. And it was this beautiful, sunny day in California, and, and uh, he had the top down on the car of his dreams, a Mercedes 450 SL. He'd only had this car for a couple of months. It was colored just the way he liked. He had dreamed about this car, and now he owns it, and he's driving in this just beautiful day. And I want to share with you <clears throat> what he wrote as he opened uh, this book. He said, I never intentionally set out to be girl-watching that day. But I spotted her about 200 yards ahead and to the left. She was jogging toward me. My eyes locked on to this goddess-like blonde, rivulets of sweat escalating down her tan body as she ran at a purposeful pace. Her jogging outfit, if it could be called that in those days before sports bras and spandex, was actually a skimpy bikini. I can't tell you what her face looked like, Nothing above the neckline registered with me that morning. My eyes feasted on this banquet of glistening flesh as she passed on my left, and they continued to follow her thin figure as she continued jogging southbound. As if mesmerized by her gait, I turned my head further and further, craning my neck to capture every possible moment for my mental video camera. Then blam! I might still be traveling at this remarkable spe- marveling at this remarkable specimen of female athleticism if my Mercedes hadn't plowed into a Chevelle that had come to a complete stop in my lane. Fortunately, I was traveling only 15 miles per hour in stop and go traffic, but the mini collision crumpled my front bumper and crinkled the hood. And the fellow I smacked into didn't appreciate the considerable damage to his rear end. I got out of the car, embarrassed, humiliated, saturated with guilt, and unable to offer a satisfying explanation. No way would I tell this guy, well, if you'd seen what I saw, you'd understand. You know, we can't help but but chuckle at that story or roll your eyes at that story, whatever your response was this morning. Because we know that lust causes problems. Some are very obvious, much like this story that I just read to you. But some ways that are not so obvious. And it's kind of easy to think that lust is just some secret sin we harbor within. Doesn't really hurt anybody. And we don't really think about all of the problems that come through this difficult area. This isn't an easy battle for anyone who struggles with this because our society flaunts sexuality. We no longer look at clothing as a means of protecting us from the weather or um, creating this comfortable modesty. Instead, clothing is often seen as a way of communicating our sex appeal our fit physiques, or just simply to draw attention. But not only is clothing seen differently than it has been in the past, but we're also fed a daily stream of radio and television advertising that promises to help or eliminate sexual problems. Over 70% of magazine ads and television commercials attempt to use sex or sexuality to sell their product. It may be a hamburger, it may be a car, it may be a business web page, it may be to advertise beer, it really doesn't matter. And we've all become so conditioned to this that we don't often think about it. And all the while, Satan is at center stage, gaining ground day in and day out, distorting our eyesight with something called lust. 
you know, part of our problem is we're living in a society that increasingly has no desire to live for Christ. So whatever guardrails that you and I may possess from being a part of Christ's family isn't out there for other people. They're just out for selfish gain, and they don't have that grid to pass through for their eyes or their thoughts or even their hearts. But the greater problem is that so many Christians have compromised their moral convictions in order to blend in with the world rather than living distinctive lives that God has called us to. We have just become more like the world instead of the other way around. And so it's time that we yielded our eyes and our minds and our hearts to the Lordship of Jesus Christ so that we can begin to see people as valuable individuals created in the image of God rather than as sexual beings. And when we yield our, our eyes and our hearts and our minds to the Lordship of Christ, it leads us to see gender distinctions and human sexuality as God created it to be. We close a series on life's landmines today. Uh, we've been talking about issues, just a few of them, that kind of trip us up along the way. Maybe things where um, the danger and the damage is noticeable at times, other times it is not. Often these things are hidden as much as possible, and we have justified or rationalized it's okay to do these things because we're not really hurting anybody else. And so we kind of focused on, on three of those in this series. We've talked about alcohol, we've talked about anger, and today we're talking about lust. But like alcoholism and anger can be misused to be harmful for us and to others and to the kingdom of God, so can the misuse of our eyes and our minds and our hearts. And so today, briefly, we just want to look at the sensitive subject of lust. There's two points on your outline this morning on the back of your bulletins. The first is that lust is a bigger problem than most will acknowledge. A bigger problem than most people will acknowledge. You know, lust is not like noticing that someone is attractive. That's not lust. And lust is not this randomly having a sexual thought cross your mind. Those things aren't lust. I mean, God created us to notice the beautiful things in the world around us. And that includes things like ocean beaches at sunset or a, a field of flowers or a rushing mountain stream or a person of the opposite sex. We can't help but to notice someone to us that seems attractive. But Billy Graham said, lust isn't the first look, it's the second and the third and the fourth look. I really like the definition from John Maxwell. He said, lust is a thought that I entertain, cherish, or hold on to that if I did what I was actually thinking, it would clearly be sin. Lust is finding yourself making up excuses for why you're calling that person on the phone when you're married and they're not. And you really don't have much business or any at all, but you're cooking up a reason because you're attracted to this person. Lust is rationalizing over the magazine and saying, it's just one week out of the entire year. And the articles are really great. That's the reason I really read this magazine. Lust is seemingly innocent, taking writing that note, and by the way it's written, expresses more than just compliments. There's a veiled message that's trying to come out in a, in a subtle way through this letter because we're attracted to this person. And all of these types of things that I'm talking about, and this is not, any, of course, any kind of exhaustive list, but all of these things damage and quench the work of the Holy Spirit in our lives. It's dressing in a way that you hope will bring attention from the opposite sex so that you will feel desired. 
all of these lustful thoughts that, that ex- are expressed in our minds and, and out through things that we do sometimes might look innocent enough to other people, but in our hearts, we are not where we should be. In a radio broadcast two summers ago, Chuck Swindoll said these words. He said, no one is immune. You're not, I'm not. Lust is no respecter of persons. Whether by savage assault or subtle suggestion, the minds of a wide range of people are vulnerable to its attack. Sharp professional men and women, homemakers, students, carpenters, artists, musicians, pilots, bankers, senators, plumbers, promoters, and preachers as well. Its alluring voice can infiltrate the most intelligent mind and cause its victim to believe its lies and respond to its appeal and beware it never gives up. Donald Miller is a licensed therapist out in California and he made the comment that his percentage of clients dealing with sexual addiction addiction and sexual problems has jumped from 15% of his clients to 70% of his clients. And I think it's really important for us to understand that lust is not just a male gender issue. It's no secret that men are visually stimulated more than women are, but that doesn't mean lust is just a male issue problem. Christine Gardner states that addicted women who are middle-aged tend to get addicted through x-rated chat rooms while younger women are increasingly attracted to pornographic imagery. But there's another area of lustful danger for women and that is in erotic romance novels. One example being the popular book from 2012, Fifty Shades of Grey. At this time last year, over 125 million copies of this book have been sold and it's been translated into 52 languages. I tried to see a more updated list of books sold. I could not find anything as re- more recent than that. And of course we realize if you follow movies, a movie version came out last year. In their book, Pulling Back the Shades, authors Dana Gresh and Dr. Julie Slattery point out that women aren't drawn into books like this for entertainment factor, and they share within this book that women have basic longings within their heart, and these longings satisfied outside of God's will can be very dangerous. They mention just a, I'll mention just a couple of things that they write about in the book. One of the things they share is that women long to escape reality. Married women can sometimes find themselves feeling bored with daily responsibilities or looking for some, some adventure in their life, and these things become something they fall into. And they seek adventure even though it's simply fantasy and not reality. Another thing they mention is that women long to be cherished by a man. And if this longing is not found in a healthy relationship, unhealthy means might be turned to. And I know just through research this week that it's not just this particular book, though it's a very popular book, and I know there's been a trilogy of books, but it's simply in a grouping of books that really Christian women have no business reading it all you know jesus had some thoughts on the subject he shared them in sermon on the mount as just for one example he had some very descriptive things to say about lust he said in matthew 5 27 to 29 you have heard that it was said do not commit adultery but i tell you that anyone looks at a woman lustfully has already committed adultery with her in his heart If your right right eye causes you to sin, gouge it out and throw it away. It is better for you to lose one part of your body than for your whole body to be thrown into hell. 
There's some pretty strong language, wouldn't you think, for a particular sin that a lot of people rationalize and say, it's really not a big deal, everybody does it. But Jesus said, it can lead you to the pits of hell if you let it. You know, in the New Testament, Jesus was constantly raising the standard of things that were taught in the Old Testament. And this statement gives us a very clear understanding, just this verse alone, of how he, what he felt about the dangers of lust. He doesn't say, oh, you know, guys are just going to be guys, or, you know, it's better just to think something instead of doing it. You know, it's better than that, so, you know, you've got to kind of take, take things as they are. It wasn't the way he approached it at all. In fact, I really like how the message paraphrases Matthew 5, 27 to 28, where it says, you know the next commandment pretty well too, don't go to bed with another spouse, but don't think you've preserved your virtue simply by staying out of bed. Your heart can be corrupted by lust even quicker than your body. Those leering looks you think nobody notices, they also corrupt did you know that we're commanded to avoid sexual impurity in nearly every book of the New Testament? Almost every single book of the New Testament has something very strong to say about avoiding sexual impurities. I think God thinks it's pretty important. One such example... It's 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 3 through 5. Where the Bible says it is God's will that you should be sanctified. That you should avoid sexual immorality. That each of you should learn to control his own body in a way that is holy and honorable. Not in passionate lust like the heathen who do not know God. God expects you and God expects me to live by his standards of sexual purity. In areas where we are not there, we need to repent. And we need to ask for his help to get to where we need to be. The second point in your outline this morning is that with God's help, lust can be overcome. With God's help, lust can be overcome. You know, it's easy to get blindsided if you think you're not susceptible to one of Satan's deceptions. To think, you know, lust might be other people's problems, sexual sin. You know, that's really not my issue. I, I'm pretty strong there. I really don't need any help there. But if you think you cannot fall into lust and eventually sexual sin, then you're more godly than David who fell or you're stronger than Samson who fell, or you're wiser than Solomon who fell as well into the realm of lust and sexual sin. And all spiritual victories begin with a humble cry to God for help, realizing that by ourselves we are powerless to overcome this struggle or any other. And as long as there is rationalization of any kind, we will sabotage ourselves by making room for lustful behaviors. We need to simply acknowledge what is there, acknowledging our weakness to things like this, and turn to the help that is available. A second thing that's helpful in this realm is to evaluate your needs. Evaluate your needs. It's good to ask questions like, why are you so tempted to lustful behavior? What is it that you need that you're missing out on? What are you trying to fill with something unhealthy or something less than what God wants for you? Why are you seeking what you want there instead of what God offers to you? Are you trying to fill an emptiness within yourself with something less than what God intends for you? And that's why lust never satisfies. It doesn't meet a need. It doesn't make your marriage better. It doesn't make you a more vigorous partner. It doesn't do any of the things that are promoted out there for you and I to engage in this kind of behavior. 
It's not something secretive that doesn't affect your relationship with your spouse. It is not something that's so secret and, and so harmless that it doesn't impact your following of Jesus Christ. It takes things away from you. It hurts you. You're not a whole person. You're not ever really fully available to the people you love and especially to a spouse if that is your situation. Your life is filled with other loyalties and other things that take you away from what God intends for you. A third thing is to consider the consequences of this kind of behavior. If you want to not get involved in some of this thing, think about what will happen if you do. It's important sometimes to make a list of people who would be impacted if you gave in to lust. How many people in your life would be impacted if you all of a sudden just turn to this and begin trying to fulfill some thing in your life that, that God never intended, but you decided this is what you want? And to stop and think of the, not only your spouse, but your kids and your parents and your siblings and the people that are your friends and the people that you work with and the people that you go to church with. And, and, you, and you can just see this ripple effect of decisions that you may make. And it's important to think about those things before you ever get to decision points of wrongdoing. To just realize there are severe consequences if you become entangled in the the web of lust and sexual sin. Actor Charles Coburn told that when he was a teenager, his dad always tried to dissuade him from going to see a burlesque show. And he would say, son, don't go there. Don't ever go there. You're going to see things there you should never see. Don't go there even the first time. You'll never forget what you saw. Coburn said sometime later he went anyway. And he said, my dad was right. I saw things I shouldn't see. I saw my dad there. I'm not sure that's really what his dad was talking about. But there he was. And it's hard to tell people to do things, to not do things that you're doing yourself. So what are the people watching us seeing us be involved in? It's so important in this area to be so careful. It's so easy to damage your witness. Your relationships can be ruined. Your personal life can become so guilt-laden, you don't even know how you're going to make it through the next day. Your job can be terminated. Your future can be changed. You may only get to see your children every other weekend. And myself and so many others have, have talked to individuals who, who, who talk about that pivotal moment when they had entertained and lusted and thought about this and, and just chucked it all to run after someone else or to get so grossly involved in pornography that they just totally gave in to sexual sin. And they talk about that pivotal moment when they made that decision and they just wish they could go back and change a decision because they had no idea all of the damage and hurt of things they could never get back. Oh, please don't ever be in that group. Maybe some of you are there today. And if so, there's still hope for you in so many ways through Jesus Christ. But if that's not been your path so far, don't go there. Be careful. You know, for those of us who are Christ followers, our bodies don't belong to us anymore anyway. When we became a follower of Christ, our bodies aren't, they don't belong to us anymore. They belong to God. 1 Corinthians six fifteen to 20 says, do you, do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ himself? Shall I then take the members of Christ and unite them with a prostitute? Never. Do you not know that he who unites himself with a prostitute is one with her in body? For it is said the two will become one flesh. But he who unites himself with the Lord is one with him in spirit. Flee from sexual immorality. All other sins a man commits are outside his body. But he who sins sexually 
sins against his own body. Do you not know that your body is a temple of the Spirit who is in you, whom you have received from God? You are not your own. You were bought at a price. Therefore, honor God with your body. I think it's important as well in the battle with lustful behavior to seek regular godly counsel. Think of ways that you can share openly with others and that you have at least one Christian confidant in your life. Sometimes we talk about how important an accountability partner can be, someone or a close Christian friend of the same sex that you can, you can share your struggles with. That you're not in this kind of a lone position where Satan can pull you away at times and really work you over, but that you have accountability with someone. You have a confidant, a Christian of the same sex, someone that you can talk to and say, man, I am just really struggling in this area. And this is an area I continue to fall, and this is what I did. And, and talk about things that you can do to change where your weaknesses are and how you respond to those things. And this person can help hold you accountable and can give you suggestions and can love on you and encourage you in ways that are so helpful to you. Satan just loves when we're dealing with something on our own because he works on our minds. We're so good at rationalizing things and justifying things, saying it's okay, this isn't hurting us. I can handle this. My relationships aren't suffering. Oh, we're so good at that. There's a popular AA slogan that says, you're only as sick as your secrets. You're only as sick as your secrets. I think it's important to realize as well that if you've suffered in this sin or any other, don't lose heart over past setbacks. Satan loves to work you over and say, well, you did this. Well, you're... You're doomed for life. You'll never, ever recover from that. You're a waste of human flesh. I mean, he just loves to grind you into the ground with things that you have done wrong in the past. And so it's so important to learn from the past and not live in the past. And that's a Satan ploy from the get-go. He just loves to grind you down and remind you of things you've done in the wrong that are and, and things that just... You need to learn from, but you need to move on. I love the words in Psalm 32, 5, where it says, Finally, I confessed all my sins to you, and I stopped trying to hide my guilt. I said to myself, I will confess my rebellion to the Lord, and you forgave me. All my guilt is gone. You know, those are the words of a free man. Those are the words of somebody who has done something awful in their lives and they have suffered within because of that and they have hurt a lot of people and hurt a lot of relationships. And that person was King David. The man after God's own heart who never ever thought he would ever fall to a sin like he did. But that simple moment of lust grew into sexual desire and grew into adultery and a pregnancy and a murder of the husband. And David suffered for that. He tried to justify it. He tried to hide behind it. But God sent a prophet and that prophet hit him right between the eyes with what David knew to be true. And David repented. In an anguish of soul, he asked God to forgive him. And you know what? God forgave him. David never forgot what he did. But God not only forgave him of what he did, but God forgave him of the guilt of his sin. 
You see, David understood that it's not just the deed that you did that God forgives, but it's those horrible, guilty feelings that, you, that Satan wants you to carry as baggage for the rest of your life. David said, God forgave me of those two. You know, the neat thing about that story is not so much what God did for David, but what God can do for you. Because God promises to do the same thing. If you're willing to repent of sins that you committed in your life, and you're willing to turn your life over to Jesus Christ and submit to him and let his, his cleansing blood, the, the life he gave on the cross to cover your sins, and you give your sins to God and he gives you in return the righteousness of Jesus. Oh, how undeserving we are. And God begins when we submit to him to change us, to transform us from the inside out through the power of his Holy Spirit. I like the words of 2 Corinthians 7, 10, which says, For the kind of sorrow God wants us to experience leads us away from sin and results in salvation. There's no regret for that kind of sorrow. But worldly sorrow, which lacks repentance, results in spiritual death. God's word here is talking about how much when God, when we come to God, he just wants us to come clean. He wants us to hurt because we have hurt God, because we have hurt ourselves, because we have hurt our Christian witness. That we're not standing there before him because we're just sorry we got caught. But that we're sorry enough to change. That we're sorry enough to surrender to him. I don't know what's going on in your life. I don't know what's robbing you of closeness with God or with your spouse. I don't know what you're harboring inside yourself. God knows, you know. I don't know. But there's some things today you need to come clean to God about. There's some things going on in your life you think aren't hurting anybody else. They're just your own little pet sin. It's not as bad as what somebody else is doing. But it's really pulling you away from God. It's hurting your walk with Him. It's hurting your influence with people, your witness, your relationships. Everything is suffering in your life more than you know. If you're in that group today, today would be a great time to turn to God and say, that fresh beginning you offer, I'm really ready for that. Let's pray. Father, what a, what a sensitive but humbling message. Father, when we look upon the, just the three things we've talked about over the last few weeks of things that do so much damage, and we rationalize and justify so many of these things and so many others. And Satan has fooled us to think these things don't hurt us or other people. And Father, the damage is so much more than we know. May we take your word on this, Father, and not our own rationalizing or the arguments of our world. May we take your word on this for what damage is really being done. And decide in our heart today, change has got to be made. Transformation has got to happen. And it only happens when God begins to work for, for, through us from the inside out through the Holy Spirit. Father, we pray for that to happen in all of our hearts where it needs to happen today. And we pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. This morning, if you have a decision to make for Jesus Christ, to accept him as your personal Lord and Savior to be willing to repent of your sins, to be willing to give your life to Christ and be buried with Him in baptism and total submission of your life in Him. Today, we'd invite you to do that. 
you look to our church home, we'd love to talk to you about that. And maybe some of us that are sitting here today just simply need to come clean. I don't mean we got to stand in front of the whole church and say what our problems are. But maybe you need to tell somebody. Someone that will pray with you that, that your heart will be open to God and He can begin doing His changes within you. You know what you need to do. During the song, an invitation song that we'll be singing, I'll be standing over here to the side. If you'd like to come talk to me, I'd be more than happy to share with you, to pray with you, to listen to you, to help guide you, to just be your friend today. I'm not here to judge you. I'm not here to make you feel bad about things you're doing that are wrong. I'm just a messenger. But I'm a broken messenger. That if it were not for the grace of Jesus... I wouldn't have any hope either. There will also be people in the back if you'd like to go talk to them today. We just encourage you to use this time as a transformation time in your walk with God while he's got your attention. Would you come do those things as we we sing?
to remember what has been done and for maybe those that aren't in that place, God, I just pray for, for you to help all of us just to be able to take this time to have that conversation with you, whatever it is that you're wanting to say to us right now. We thank you, and it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.